Hello, and thank you for tuning in to Late Night Hockey. I'm your host, Steven Zahoyas, and today I'm joined by a very special guest. I'm joined by Scott Pianowski of Yahoo Fantasy. Scott and I, we're going to do a lot of award talk, but Scott, thanks so much for joining the show today. My pleasure. I always uh, have time to talk some hockey, especially with a good Canadian lad like yourself. And uh, <laughs> look, hey, we did it. We, we just about got through the full season. There were some bumps along the way, but it's, I think it's going to go down as a very memorable year. I can't wait for the playoffs and a lot to talk about today. Yeah, there was a bit of a unique uniqueness to this season that I'm sure we'll never see again. So that's one positive, obviously, like you said. With all the COVID outbreaks, too, there was a bit of uh, a wonder if everyone was going to get to the finish line, but it looks like all teams will. And before we get into the awards talk, because that's what we're going to center the show around today, you can't start a hockey conversation these days without talking about the Tom Wilson incident from Monday night. And Scott, I just want your reaction to what happened, the NHL suspension, and then just kind of everything that came out in the aftermath of it. Yeah, I mean, to, to me, I, I think maybe the biggest surprise of this whole thing is how the Rangers just went, pushed all their chips in, said, what's going on here? This this doesn't belong in our game. And, you know, of course, they're going to get a heavy fine for that. I think they already have already. But I, I grew up at a time, um, I'm old enough to remember when hockey, when hockey was a big fighting game and it, every team had an enforcer. And, you know, I mean, you go back, watch the 80s movie Young Blood. that's all about you know, can, can Rob Lowe get past the enforcer, Dwayne Racky, who's on the other team and everything. And I like, I think hockey works best when the skilled players can do what they do. I, obviously it's a physical game. Obviously you're never going to want to take away checking and, and two-way play and everything. But I, I think Tom Wilson is the dirtiest player in the league. I think he tries to hurt people, tries to intimidate people in a way that I don't think belongs in the game. And I, I think it's time for the league and the player association, everybody they exist to protect the innocent, not the guilty. And to me, Tom Wilson, this is, he's a repeat offender. He's done this garbage over and over again. And I, I don't think you can suspend him heavy enough. I, I just want to see, again, play as physical as you want. Take the body by all means. You, you want to try to get somebody's head, you know, physically, but cleanly, I'm all for it. But Tom Wilson tries to hurt people. And it's time that we take this, I think, garbage out of the game. My biggest thing with player safety was the fact that they didn't even give him a one game suspension and they invited what happened on Wednesday night to happen. Really? If you take Tom Wilson out of the equation, he's not on the ice. I don't think you have as heated heads between those two teams that we saw on Wednesday. So that to me was the biggest thing. Why not just give him a one game suspension, right? At least at minimum. Yeah. I, it's, I think the NFL, the NHL botched this. And again, I'm glad there's been some blowback. And all I can hope for is maybe there'll be some reform in the process or uh, the, the league will look at what, what do we really want to stand for? You know, sh shouldn't we be more about the Connor McDavid's of the league or the you know, Andre Veselesky's of the league? I'm, I don't want to give away some of my awards picks. So <laughs> I might be, I might be picking Connor uh, McDavid for the hard trophy. Yeah. <laughs> I, I hope I'm not taking anybody by surprise by that. But uh, to me, I mean, I'm, I'm old enough and grumpy enough that I, I'm still a little bit salty about expansion when in the in the 90s, when Gar Gary Bettman said, OK, if you're not one of the more talented teams, just clutch and grab your way to as many 2-1 games as you can get. I I want to see the skill. I want to see Mario Lemieux and, and Yarmir Yager and, and, and Paul Correa and guys like that move the puck and not turn it into a tractor trailer pull. So I, I think this is a, a negative that can be a positive. Uh, I just hope this leads to a lot of positive discussions and reform about what we want in hockey and what we want to take out of the game. And I think what Wilson, the type of player he's done and the type, the type of player he's become, the type of things he's done over and over again, I just think we need to get this out of hockey. Agreed. Five suspensions. And there's nothing wrong with physical play. As you mentioned, a good body check is never a bad thing to see out on the ice, but when you're doing stuff the way he is and the way he's conducted himself, I just don't think that stuff is necessary one bit, but, Enough about Tom Wilson. We've, we've talked more than enough about that guy. Let's start now with the NHL awards. And Scott and I, we're going to run down a list of NHL awards that have yet to be decided and give who we think should win or who we think will win and who would get our vote. And we'll start off with the Hart Trophy. Scott, you teased it a little bit there. Who is your Hart Trophy guy? Yeah, it, it's Connor McDavid who is, you know, this is going to, I don't know if this is going to sound as a, as a feature or a bug for him, but he's become the Mike Trout of hockey in the sense that he's at the top of his game 
and he's been on a lot of Oriel, uh, Oriel, Orioles, Oilers, <laughs> baseball writer, Oilers teams that haven't done much. Now they're, they're headed to the playoffs, so I can't wait to see. You know, I wouldn't want to do this every year, but this year having the the different divisions, we only played the same teams, and having an all Canadian division, I thought was a lot of fun. Again, I wouldn't want to do it every year, but um, I'm really looking forward to seeing what the Oilers might be able to do in the playoffs. But with David flirting with a hundred point season in a truncated year, it's just unbelievable. It's not just look, guys can get points. You know, you, you play a lot of ice time, you get a lot of power play time, you have quality teammates, but McDavid scores goals where it's like, Oh my God, did you see this? You have to run the Twitter. If you haven't seen it already, he's that type of guy. And then there was a great night. I don't know, maybe two months ago where Austin Matthews, who I would actually have second in the voting had a great game. And then McDavid played later that night. He said, Oh, okay. Matthews had a great game. Watch this. And, and then threw up like a hat trick in like half in like maybe uh, 25 minutes or something like that. He's probably the fastest player in the league. He's the most dynamic player in the league. The points are there. The goals are there. Obviously, Dreisaitl has won an MVP before, but I think Connor McDavid has to be the pick. I would have Matthew second, and I hope somewhere on the down ballot, I'm not saying this guy should win, but I've watched a lot of Vegas games this year, and Mark Stone plays every inch of the ice. He's a wizard with the puck. He reads the flow so well. He's the captain of the team, the emotional epicenter of the team, and I think he's had the type of season that should show up at the you know, somewhere on the Hart Trophy balloting. I'm by no means saying he should win it over McDavid or over Matthews. But I, if you were going to look at like five or six candidates, I think Mark Stone deserves somebody putting him at the, at the bottom of his ballot. I think he's had that great of a season. I love Mark Stone too. And I agree. If you look at his body of work, he's one of those players that, He's not the fastest guy on the ice. He doesn't have the best shot, but he just competes at such a high level and he does all of the little things right. And he is the driving force on that Vegas offense. But to get to my award winner, I'm in a total agreement with you as well. My vote would go to Connor McDavid and I think he'll win the award as well. But I agree. I think Mark Stone should get some love. And another guy too that I'll throw it a little bit deeper, I think is Brad Marchand from the Boston Bruins. Mm. He's really, even when this team was going through a lot of injuries and some thinner times, he was continually producing for this team. So I think Marchand deserves a little bit of love as well, but I'm with the, you with McDavid being my vote and the guy who I think will win. The next trophy we'll talk about is the Calder Trophy. And Jason Robertson from the Dallas Stars has certainly made this a little bit more of an interesting race. It seemed like for the first half of the year, we were just ready to give it to Krill Kaprizov. Has Robertson done enough, or anybody for that matter, Scott, done enough to surplant Krill Kaprizov as the Calder Trophy winner this year? Yeah, yeah, I think Kaprizov sealed this one early. I mean, look, the advantage of being a little bit older than your typical rookie, he had the KHL experience. When I saw that this guy actually scored goals in the KHL, a league where it's almost illegal to score, I'm like, man, I think he's going to come over and be a factor right away. And then he, he scores like a highlight film goal to win a game in Los Angeles. I think his first or second game in the, in the league. I feel like they've engraved this trophy a long time ago. There's a lot of good young players who have impressed me this year. I think this would be a heck of a race if Kaprizov wasn't on board. But he scored too many goals. He scored too many highlight goals, even on a Minnesota team that is – I always feel like they want to play – you know, the whole 200 feet sheet of the ice. And I, I don't think they're going to, I think he may have more scoring upside if he were on a different team that just said, look, just score as many goals as you can. We don't care how much you play defense or whatever, but coming into the league at a more advanced age with more advanced physical conditioning and shape. I, I, that's such a huge advantage for a rookie. And I think he's going to win this. It's going to be really close to unanimous. I'm in full agreement with you there. I always say when you look at Robertson, I say he's a good part of a really talented group there offensively in Dallas. You got guys like Joe Pavelski, Rope Hints when he's healthy. Like that's a good offense and he works well with those members. I look at Kaprizov as kind of the life and blood of Minnesota's offense, the way they approach things. He leads them in goals, leads them in points. I just think he is the guy in that offense. And as you mentioned, Dean Evason has that team running very defensively. They've always been a defensive oriented team. So the, what he's been able to do is very impressive, even more so when you consider everything about the situation that he's in. So I'm in agreement. Two time KHL goal scoring King Krill Kaprizov gets my vote as well for Calder Trophy Award. And remember too, there are good forwards on, on the wild, but it's not like he's playing with somebody who like in a full season would be a 70 assist man. You know I mean? Th think of what 
Pete Joe Thornton used to do where one year Jonathan Chichu scored 56 goals. And I swear 55 of them must've been from Thornton, just the unbelievable feeds. Minnesota's a worker B team and Kaprizov is just this electric offensive talent in a sense. I, I feel like he might be misplaced. I'll take to see him on a team that played a little bit more running gun, but he came into the league. He was good from the first shift. And there's just a, there's a certain bounce and a certain joie de vivre when he plays. I mean, just he's one of those guys, every time you know he's on the ice, you think, okay, for the next you know 30 to 45 to 60 seconds, I got to make sure I have my eyes on this guy because he might do something incredible. Yeah, and I think his performance this week too solidified it. Scored big goals against the Vegas Golden Knights in their two games against Vegas and then scored the game winner on Friday night against the Ducks. He gets that one. I think those are the two easy awards when you break it down. Now I think now we're going to move into some more interesting debates and, and arguments per se for players. We'll start off with the Vesna Trophy. Scott, who do you think will win and who gets your vote for Vesna Trophy? Yeah, I've been going back and forth on this. I actually had a ticket early in the year on Mark andre Flory when, uh, when Robin Lehner went down and Flory had to be the, the bell cow in Vegas. It, it, it's always hard with goalies because – I look at Flurry, and I mean, the defense in front of him is so good in Vegas, but I mean, the defense is so good in front of Andre Veseleski in Tampa Bay. And I, I just think this, the save percent, some of the numbers, especially, I mean, I know that we have, we're in an era now where there's all these great secondary and, and tertiary metrics, but you still, I think, win the, goal, the Vesna trophy by your, your win-loss record, your save percentage, your goals against the average. And, and Vasilevsky in a year where Tampa Bay has not had a full complement of players, I, I think it's hard not to give it to him, even though I have maybe a couple of jelly beans on Mark andre Flory. <laughs> I think Vasilevsky's going to win, but you could make a case for probably three or four goalies, and I wouldn't have a major argument. My vote, this might come as a little bit shocking. My vote would go to UC Saros from the Nashville Predators. And mm -hmm. this kind of hinges on the fact that Nashville makes the playoffs. But I just look at the work that he's done since coming back from an injury from March 18th onwards. He's played in 22 games. He's got 15 wins, owns a 941 save percentage and a 1.94 goals against average. And then even if you look at his numbers on the year as a whole, they've been really solid. I think when he came back, he joined a Nashville team that was treading in very deep waters. It didn't look like they were going to make a push at all for the playoffs. His plays really vaulted them into the playoff race in the central. They're not locked in them and Dallas are still going back and forth. So my vote would go to Saros, but I do think Vasilevsky will win the award this year, but Saros is kind of my, my first pick, but I don't think the voters will see it that way. He has had a great season. I mean, you know, Na Nashville's a tough team because they don't play. I mean, they're very well supported in Nashville, and it's a really exciting place to watch a game. And obviously they've made deep runs in the playoffs before. But it's not if, if you're having that season on an original six team or having that season in a hockey market that we're just used to maybe celebrating a little bit more, I just feel like Nashville, not that they're in any means a small market team, and Nashville's a great city. And again, they've had success, but – I think he might be shielded a little bit where if he were having the season on, on the Maple Leafs, if he was having the season, if the Red Wings were good and he was having the season Detroit or something or Boston or New York, I think maybe he'd get a little bit more juice in the voting, but I, you, you make a great point. I and mean, he's been absolutely standing on his hands since he got healthy again. And sometimes it's just strange when we see a changing of the guard, we, we know a team used to have a, a veteran goalie who was a presence and then somebody else takes over. And, and sometimes I think we're slow to accept that this new guy is actually better and the team has made a change that's improved their fortunes. I think he's a great, much like I think Mark Stone deserves that down ballot MVP love. I hope Saros is reflected in the final Vesna voting. Yeah, and it's a weird situation between the pipes and Nashville because you had Pekarine. They drafted Yaroslav Askarov in the first round last year, too, to be the heir to the throne between the pipes. But then all of a sudden, you got UC Saros now playing on an expiring contract, playing really well, and is the biggest reason why they're back in the playoffs. But to get back to your point about Marc-Andre Fleury, one thing that I think might get him a few more votes is when you look at his career, it's surprising, but he does not have a single Vesna trophy to mm -hmm. his name. So... That could be something now in the later stages of his career. Who knows if he's able to repeat and have another season like this could land him a couple of votes. The legacy votes, I like to call them, could favor Marc-Andre Fleury because he has been excellent for Vegas all season long. Sometimes it turns into a lifetime achievement award where they, it's saying, yes, you had a great season, but also you should have won this award at some point, you know, somewhere down the line and you haven't. And 
you know, he's a little bit like a modern Grant Fear. I mean, you think of all the years he played in Pittsburgh where the center of that team was always going to be Sidney Crosby and, and, and Malkin and all, you know, Chris Letang and all the great offensive talent they had. And sometimes because they're trying to win a game, maybe six to three or five to four, the, the goaltender gets hung out the dry a little bit and won't have those cosmetic stats that reflect how valuable he really is. And I, I've been spoiled this year. One of my go-to things has been whenever Colorado and Vegas play, I just, I, I try to watch those teams anyway, because they're just really fun to watch, but whenever they play, the games have been unfreaking believable. And, and on, on several occasions, uh, flurry has been the reason why you know, Vegas has gotten the two points. I, it looks like Vegas is going to finally win that division. I, I hope that Colorado and Vegas play in the playoffs. Cause I think it's going to be a seven game, just hockey delight. I agree. I think, I hope, that's the series we get in the second round in that West, that first round series, which is looking more and more like Colorado versus Minnesota will be a lot of fun too. But I think that is the series hockey fans are just kind of salivating over wanting to see in the semifinals. Now to move forward to the Norris trophy talk, who do you think will win Scott? Who gets your vote? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go with Victor Hedman here. And just one of those guys never comes off the ice power play shorthand. This is Tampa Bay doesn't have their full lineup. Of course, Kucherov hasn't played, but I just feel that he impacts the game every, every, I, I want, I like my Norris trophy winners. I'm not, I'm not opposed to when a guy who's just all offense won. I mean, you know, there was a time when Paul Coffey won some Norris trophies. And even though I grew up in new England, I'm like, Hey, Ray Bork's a better all around player. The offensive stats that Coffey was putting up were just ridiculous. You couldn't deny them, but you know, had been plays every sheet of the ice. He's the, I think the uh, undisputed leader of this team. And one thing that surprised me is that, if we had said before the season, I was wondering what young defenseman would maybe jump into this race. And I thought, you know, maybe Cole McCarr, who I think still may get some votes. Maybe he would be ready to take the step up. Maybe Quinn Hughes would be ready to take the step up. It's, it's been kind of a hard year for Vancouver with the stops and starts. And Hughes still has some things to figure out in his defensive zone, although he's a wonderfully talented offensive player and very gifted with the puck, sees the game very well. But man, did the Rangers hit a home run with Adam Fox. I, I think he's had an unbelievable season. I think if the season lasted another, we saw a full season and we still had like another six weeks to go. I think Fox would be in a position to maybe steal the award. He's going to be somebody I'm certainly going to be proactively drafting for fantasy next year. You're going to have to, because other people are going to want to get him. But in a year where everything went wrong, you know, Tony D'Angelo situation went off the rails immediately. Uh, Adam Fox turned into a star in New York. And I think he's going to reflect well in the voting, but I think Hedman is a deserved favorite. It's who I would vote for. And I think he's going to win. Yeah, Fox has been stellar to that point, leads the league in assists. He's been probably the biggest vaulter as we talk about players who took a step forward this year. I, I wrote about him an article of mine recently. I said he'll probably be a top 40 pick in fantasy, no questions asked, just based off the production of this season and the pedigree as well. I am in agreement with you that I think Hedman will win. I would give my vote, though, to Darnell Nurse of the mm. Edmonton Oilers. I, I look at this Edmonton Oilers defense, and there's not a lot to love. It is not a very good unit, but I feel like nurse has established himself as a clear number one. He's playing over 25 and a half minutes a night. He leads he's second in the league in goals. He's got 16. As far as the defenseman goes, he leads all defensemen in plus minus, which is plus 29. And I know people like to point at plus minus as a bit of a flawed stat, but I do believe in it in the extreme cases when you have guys who are either right near the top of the category or right near the bottom. I think there's some merit to it. And for him to lead the league in plus minus at plus 29 is impressive. You talk about two-way defenseman. He does it at both ends of the ice. He's a big physical presence. And I think he's starting to use his size a little bit more this year, which is always something I was waiting for with Nurse because when I watched him with the Sioux Greyhounds, he was always this big defenseman, bigger than a lot of players in the Ontario Hockey League. And he used his size, but it took him a little while in the NHL, but I think he's finally figured it out. So my vote would go to Nurse, but I do think Hedman wins the award. I love everything you said about Nurse. And I agree that sometimes the, the bigger defensemen need more time to blossom. And I just want to mention, and it just kind of spurs my memory to mention one other guy, but I, again, with nurse, I totally agree. I mean, Edmonton often plays firewalk fire wagon hockey, and you need a stabilizing guy in front of the net, somebody who can play the body, certainly handy with the puck as the goals tell you, but it takes sometimes defensemen, especially the taller guys, a little bit of development time. And I just want to spot like this guy isn't going to win, but Jacob Chikrin, the year he's had in Arizona, man, oh man, what a shot. What of just a great vision of the of the ice? He's super on the power play, 
His father, of course, was an NHL player. He actually was kind of an enforcer. Uh, it, they took a while. They always expected big things from him. He was drafted, I think, fairly early. But Jacob Chikrin's become a star. And again, this Coyotes team, it's not, you know, they're not going to be one of the glamour teams that you get promoted on, you know, on the national NHL network and stuff. You, you may not see them a lot, but uh, number six in your program, number one in your hearts, he, he's a very, very good offensive player and, and, and capable on defense, getting better all the time. And it's just a reminder that, you know, what, like what McCarr did coming into the league is unusual. You know, the guy, it takes these guys a lot of time sometimes, especially if they, you know, McCarr was in college for a while. If these guys are in the NHL in their teens, you got to be patient. That's why everybody's just like scratching their head and saying, Hey, how come Rasmus Dallin isn't a star yet? You got to give these guys time. Everybody has their own development curve. And, and I don't know, maybe it's time to blow things up with Buffalo. I'm very curious to see if Jack Eichel is in trade talks this summer, but uh, Jacob Trickren, if, if the vote were breakout defenseman of the year, I think, and I didn't give it to Fox, I would have to give probably a stick salute to, to Jake Chikrin in the desert. I'm in full agreement with you there, Scott. I'm glad you mentioned Jacob Trick Chikrin. That scored you a lot of points on the show. We talk, I talk about him on the show all the time. One of my favorite defensemen to watch. And he's not the biggest guy. He's got good size. He's six foot two, but he's one of those guys that as he continues to develop, I think you'll start to see him use his size a little bit more and become a little bit more of a physical player. But he does it as far as block shots go. He can score. He's got a wicked shot. And on a Coyotes team that doesn't have a lot of finishers, he's actually one of the dependent upon players to put the puck in the net on that team. So I'm glad you mentioned Jacob Chikrin. And if you because- watch, let me say one more thing about Chikrin. If you watch them play, he's not afraid not just to join the rush, but you'll see he'll take shots from the slot. I mean, he'll if they're in a situation where they need to score, he will pinch all the way in and basically play forward. I think he's got unbelievable hockey sense and hockey IQ. And that's why... I know goals can be a little bit fluky for defensemen year over year because they're shooting from further away. And it's not unusual. You, you think of uh, the, the year that um, I'm trying to think of the year that, that Riley had a couple of years ago in Toronto where everything went in the next year, nothing did, but I think Chikrin has the, the, just the style of play and the way he reads things and isn't afraid to be aggressive and take chances. I think he's the rare defenseman. You can say every year from here on out, I think he's going to score 15 goals a year. Maybe some year he might get 20. I'm in agreement. That's a high end caliber shot that he possesses. So the goals aren't fluky when it comes to Jacob Chikrin. We'll now talk about the Selkie trophy and this trophy. We talked about Mark Stone as being someone who's one of the better two way forwards in the game. I'm curious, did he make your Selkie trophy vote? And do you think he will win or do you got someone else in mind? I'm going to go with Stone, and I think he has a good chance of winning. We know this is the Patrice Bergeron award. And, you know, as a long, long line Bruins fan, I see the Bruins pennant in your in at the top of your shot there. So I, I know you have a little bit of love for the Bruins or at least respect for the Bruins. I'm never upset when Bergeron wins, but he missed a fair amount of time this year. And Stone, I, I wish I could remember off the top of my head who did this. Somebody did a video on Twitter of just Mark Stone stealing the puck from other people. And it just, he's so crafty. The guy's a wizard. He understands, again, the reading of the flow of the game and, and knowing when to lift a stick, knowing when to make subtle. Everything in this game, I think, is subtle. He's one of those guys that, if you were to just to watch Vegas highlights, you'd see him show up, but to really appreciate him, you get to watch a game from start to finish and just spend shifts watching everything he does with and without the puck. I think he's the best. I think he's the best all around forward in hockey. I think he's the best defenseman in hockey. I think he is going to win the Selkie uh, in part. Look, we, we know what the Selkie is, right? It doesn't hurt if you score some goals, even though it's strictly a defensive award, uh, they've kind of gone away with the idea that some guy who scores three goals is going to ever win this again, but uh, it's a Paris. Patrice Bergeron award that the award could even be named for him someday, but I got to give this one to Mark Stone. And just to let you know too, I'm a lifelong Bruins fan as well. So we got that in common and I I promise no bias in this, but I did pick Patrice Bergeron as my vote and the person I do think will win the award. And it just boils down to the fact that if you wanted to, you could give it to him every year. Like you said, the award (laughs) might one day even be named after him, but you just watch the way he plays a 200 foot game. And Typically, I, I historically think it's a lot harder for wingers to win the award like a Mark Stone. I think when you look at someone like Patrice Bergeron, who plays the middle of the ice, he's so involved in both ends. I always joke, whenever the Bruins are five on four and they're on the penalty kill and it's him and, Ber- and Marshawn on the ice, it's not like a five on four. It's almost like you're playing at even strength. That's how offensively and defensively gifted those two players are. So my vote would go to Bergeron. I do think Mark Stone deserves a lot of love, 
but I think you look at the way he's able to dominate still in the faceoff dot leads the league in faceoffs, which, you know, we talk about offense sometimes being the best form of defense. If you got the puck, if you can bank on him to win the draw 60 plus percent of the time, you're in good shape. So I would go with Patrice Bergeron, who's having a nether standout year. I would not hate it though, if Mark Stone got it, because like you mentioned, when you watch the Vegas Golden Knights, you see this is why he was named the captain of the team because he leads by total example. Yeah, and I love that you mentioned the faceoffs. What's more disheartening to a team? You're on the power play. You got good pressure going on. The puck eventually gets frozen, and then the team that's shorthanded wins the faceoff, and they get they get the puck down the ice, and you know you've lost all your momentum, and 15 to 20 seconds are burned. I also love you mentioned Marchand earlier, and let's be fair. We talked about Tom Wilson, who's a dirty player. There is an element of Marchand's game that I wish he would clean up and be a little bit smarter. Sometimes I don't want to be a hypocrite about that, but. One thing I love about Marchand, and this goes back to my roots as a hockey fan, where Wayne Gretzky said, look, it's great to try to score shorthanded. The other teams, you know, they're not thinking about defense. Sometimes they have the wrong people on the point. You can exploit this. Gretzky scored a ton of shorthanded goals. Mario Lemieux scored a ton of shorthanded goals. In today's game, a lot of times the people who score shorthanded goals aren't necessarily offensive players, but Marchand's a guy who he's always thinking, hey, if I'm just one bounce of the puck away from having a breakaway let's try to exploit this it's a great time what breaks a it's like a pick six in football right what breaks the team's spirit more than allowing a shorthanded goal right I mean these are these games these are fantasy game changers I'm in some leagues that count power play points I almost wish we'd count shorthanded points I wish there was a way to get the shorthanded goal into fantasy hockey I just love the way a player like Marchand and this is obviously tied to Bergeron too how they're not rather than just oh I have the puck let's just get rid of it and let's just kill some time let's rag the puck for a while let's handle it for a while and if we see a chance to break especially if the other team has maybe a forward on defense somebody's not used to manning the position let's take advantage I there's nothing that gets my blood pumping more than a shorthanded goal and the Bruins seem to understand how to utilize that as a weapon. Yeah, it's kind of one of those sneaky times in the game where the other team is not really thinking defense at all. When you're on the power play, your mind is fully on, let's put this puck in the back of the net. How are we going to sort this out? And that's why you'll see guys when they're on the power play kind of coast back into their own zone. And you got guys like Marshawn and Bergeron, who, as you mentioned, defensively and offensively are talented enough to exploit that kind of lack in effort defensively. So I'm in agreement with you. I think Mark Stone deserves some votes, but I, I would give it to Bergeron just based on, I feel like this is an award where, where we're kind of always looking to give it to someone else as well. So I would go Bergeron, but I, I am all for the Mark Stone argument. Lastly, we're going to talk about the Jack Adams award. And this is a year where I think there's a lot of different candidates that are getting interest typically, or sometimes in the past, you got one guy on a team, who is just super exceeding expectations to the point where it's hard to ignore it this year, Scott, I think there's a few different options you can go with who would be your vote and who do you think would win the Jack Adams award? This is the hardest one of all the, all the awards. I think you could give it to several guys. As you said, it's, it's usually the team out of nowhere award the, the team that quote unquote improved award. And you see a lot it, it's in a lot of sports, it's not common for coaches of the year to not last that long because a team will be maybe a surprise one year, but maybe it's a fluke. It isn't sustainable. And then those guys are out of work a few years later. I looked at four or five different guys. I'm not really sure. This is one of those things where if I had a vote, I would vote the latest possible minute they gave, they gave me to vote this because I, Joe Quenville in Florida, I think is a legitimate candidate. Rod Brindamore has done a great job with, with a very, a very talented Carolina team. I, I, I think Brindamore right now is the guy I'd be leaning towards, but if anybody wanted to give it to Quinville, if anybody wanted to give it to Dean Everson, who you mentioned earlier, who I think has done a great job and they found a long-term solution there. The job Keefe has done in Toronto, uh, they needed a, a different voice in a different direction after the Babcock years. And I, I think Toronto is a very dangerous team and hockey is just better when Toronto's good. It's like, the baseball is better when the Yankees are good. I'm not a Yankees fan, but I mean, baseball needs the Yankees. Football is better when the Cowboys are good. College football is better when Notre Dame is good. It's just nice to see the Leafs relevant again and to be a legitimate cup contender. Today, I'm going to say Rod Brindamore. If we were taping this a day or two later, I might say Joe Quenville. I might say Everson. I might say Keefe. And there, there could be candidates I'm not naming. I think this is the hardest race to handicap right now. Put me down for Brindamore. It's like you saw my sheet, Scott, because my vote goes to Rod Brindamore as well. And then I do think Quenville wins, but I would give it to Brindamore because 
I do agree that sometimes we kind of always try to seek out the team that had the biggest improvement, which, you know, I'm sure the coach has part to do with it, but it'd be silly to put it all on the head coach. The players are the ones out there playing, of course. But when I look at the Carolina Hurricanes top in a very good central division, I see a team that embodies the way Brendamore played the game. Like when I watch the Carolina Hurricanes, I see a bunch of Rod Brendamores on the ice, even players who you wouldn't think of like skilled players like Sebastian Ajo, they embody that. They give you a good second effort on the puck. I think that's one of the things that, it's hard to quantify it. And when you're watching it, you see it. But when you watch this Carolina team play, they're a feisty team to go up against. They play the game the right way, just like Rod Brandenburg did. I do think, though, Quenville wins. I think you have a great track record as him as a head coach, a three-time Stanley Cup champion. This Florida team has looked leaps and bounds better than they did last year. Although I do think Bill Zito, the general manager, is partly responsible for their increase in play and the talent on that roster. I do think Quinville gets it, but Rob Brendamore, I think the Carolina Hurricanes, they better lock him up soon because he is not signed past this season as head coach. And I think he's already one of, if not the best in the game right now. Totally agree. And, and these are teams where, although there's certainly top end talent on these teams, you, you really see the depth of the second and third lines that these guys throw out. And some of the breakout players we've seen in both of these cities Look at that blue line in, in Florida, people who nobody was drafting like Uyghur in fantasy. He's become, I think, like a top 25 defenseman. And you have to give some of that uh, to uh, to Quenville. And I also, another thing I've always liked about Quenville, the, the idea that he lasted so long in Chicago. And look, I, I know that they won Stanley Cups and everything, but we're in a day and age where it's hard for one coach to stay in the same spot for a while because players tune you out. You, you need it to, the organization wants to go in a new direction. If they, God forbid, start a season off slow for a month or two. And the fact that he was able to, to be the steady hand. Yeah. I, I like that Quenville is tough enough to maybe tough is the wrong word, but he's firm enough to get his point across, but he's also smart enough to know when the back off. And I think he relates to different types of players emotionally, which is how you, make a successful coach. So I'm really glad that he's had a nice act in, uh, in with the Lark, with the uh, Florida Panthers, but Brenda Moore, I, there's so much, there's so much right with that team. And a lot of it's subtle. It's hard. I feel like I'd be more qualified to vote for this. I, I used to be a beat writer for sports where I'd actually travel to games, be in locker rooms and stuff like that. Now I'm, I'm more of an outsider. And so I wish sometimes I could be, I could have a quiet discussion with Sebastian Aho and be like, Hey, you know, tell me about Rod Brenda Moore. What's the practice like, you know, or if you're, you, you've been in a slump for three or four days, what, what might he say to you? I, I wish I could maybe have a better inside take of what the personality and day-to-day -day relations these guys have with their players. So I, I feel like I, I'm a little bit outside on this award because I'm just not as circled and networked to that as I once was, but a lot of good candidates there. And uh, you know, if, if our pick of Brindamore ends up winning, you know, we'll look good. And I think it will be a really good pick, but I, I would have no problem with any of the guys that we mentioned. No, and even another thing working in Quenville's favor, you look at a guy like Aaron Eckblad, who was having a Norris caliber season. He goes down, and that defense really doesn't skip a beat. I know they added Brandon Montour at the trade deadline, but no one's comparing Brandon Montour to Aaron Eckblad, especially the way he was playing this year. So that's another thing where you lose your clear number one defenseman, albeit it's a good deep group they have in Florida. Still losing your number one hurts, and they really haven't had a major drop off. So Quenville, he's got a lot of things working towards him, but I'm with you. I would still side with Rod Brendamore. But Scott, that's going to do it for this episode of Late Night Hockey. Thanks so much for being on the show. I really do appreciate it. Let people know where they can find your work. I'm sure if anyone who plays fantasy sports knows already where to find Scott Pianowski's work, but if not, where, to, where can they find it? Thanks so much for having me. I really had a blast. And it just I consider this just a continuation of all the good discussions we have on Twitter. That's probably the best place to get in touch with me, Scott underscore Pianowski, uh, P-I-A-N-O-W-S-K-I on Twitter. I've been with Yahoo coming up on 13 years. I cover a little bit of everything, a little bit of hockey, a little bit of football, a little bit of baseball, dip into basketball a little bit, even some gaming if you're in, into that type of stuff. So, um, you know, I'm always in season. I love all sports. Um, I'm a basketball fan, too, although I don't really write about it that much. And I'm a huge music fan. So if you, you know, if you want to talk about a song, you want to talk about a defenseman, you want to talk about the NFL draft, whatever it is, um, you know, I'm your man. Come find me on Twitter. Let's have a good talk. It's that wide range of coverage, which has made you one of the best 
analyst, not just for fantasy, but music and all your interests, Scott. You're always a great mind and your opinion. I always really put a lot of weight in your opinion of what you have to say. So I think anyone who's been in fantasy sports and has played does the exact same. So Scott, thanks again so much for being on the show today. Nice of you to say. I'm right back at you. I think the world of your work and uh, hey, we got playoffs coming up. I can't wait. The I mean, what, what's better than the the two or three month war, the fantasy of the um, NHL playoffs. So I think we're going to have a great season. I look forward to talking about it. Yeah, same here, Scott. Look forward to talking about it and keeping in touch. Take care. Take care.